Tessa. Good evening. I'm Jean Rudling from Badger News. How are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm splendid, in fact. All ready for the demonstration, are we? Oh, yes, yes. Everything is ready to go. I can't see anything should go wrong. Great. Well, let's begin. Whenever you're ready. Yes, let's. Good evening, Pierce. Good evening. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good, good. And you, Margaret, also in fine fettle, are we? Oh, of course, of course. Good, good. Now, as I have explained before, this is Jean Rudling from Bachelor News, and the discussion is going to go out live. And Jean will be leading the discussion. Okay? Please? Please. Great. Here we are then. Well, do make yourselves comfortable. Now, as arranged, the topic of the discussion is poverty and inequality. You'll both have very different views, of course, but that's all part of the fun. We may even disagree, or should I say, beg to differ, but that's no reason to get upset, right? No, of course not. No, no. <laughs> no, no, we're all adults. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As part of our series, The State of the World Today, tonight we are discussing a serious global problem, one which is close to our hearts, inequality and poverty in modern society. I'm joined on my left by Piers Brogan and on my right by Margaret Cokeson. Good evening to you both. Good evening. My first question is to you, Margaret, of course, ladies first. People complain these days about there being too much inequality between the rich and the poor, and hence poverty. What would you say to them? Well, let's start with a basic fact that can't be denied. There always has been inequality of wealth and always will be. Even in the earliest tribal societies of hunters and gatherers, some people have proven to be more successful than others, and maybe more intelligent, and will work harder. This is genetically determined. Would you agree with that assessment, Piers? Yes, to a point. But inequality of wealth or status does not mean poverty. If we look today at tribal societies, we will see that there is almost no poverty as we would understand it. Despite inherent differences between members of the tribe, the strong look after the weak. For example, as Margaret, I'm sure, would be the first to admit, in hunter-gatherer societies, the hunters protect the women and children. Do you agree, Margaret? Well, this is a very rose-tinted view of early societies. I mean, even today we have matriarchal societies oh. where the women do the gathering and the men stay at home. But it is true to say there will be better and more competent human beings, men or women. That seems to make sense, doesn't it? Yes, it may seem to make sense, but I think it's important that we place Margaret's noble savage in context. She's talking of a time before agriculture, Cain killing Abel and everything that followed, the spread of the written word, cities, in fact, everything we would call civilization. And incidentally, the rise of massive surplus wealth and patriarchal hierarchies. And you must admit the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, science, technology, your computer, and ah, ah, the washing machine. And climate change and destruction of the environment. Ah, so it was all downhill all the way, was it? What are you, some kind of anti-civilizationist? Oh, what's that supposed to mean? It sounds like gobbledygook to me. Well, yes, I think we are in danger of losing the thread here. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. <sighs> Let's get back to inequality nowadays. Uh, look at the modern workplace today and you will see immediately the differences in competence and capability amongst the staff. And then leadership. When I work with a group of people, I notice at once that some people are good at making decisions, usually women nowadays, <laughs> whereas others just dither and hum and are, ah, if you know what I mean. These people obviously will and should be paid less. Yes, I think we would all agree that these lazy layabouts do not deserve to be compensated as well as those who are clever and keep their noses to the grindstone. 
though I'm not entirely sure I agree with you that women are, in fact, better decision-makers than men. Well, yes, but I won't <laughs> rise to that one. <laughs> now, the fact is that it is these weaker human beings, uh, male or female, who are the dross of society, who will end up unemployed. Uh, very interesting. You both agree, then, that inequality is somehow inherent in society. But if I may push the topic in another direction, is it not true to say that these weaker human beings, as you call them, may in fact be handicapped or unhealthy and cannot go out hunting or working in offices? They may require special care and attention. Well, what about them, Margaret? Well, sorry, but that goes without saying. I mean, naturally, we're going to need some sort of social net to make sure the weakest and poorest do not end up on the streets begging or dying of illness or starvation. We all agree on that. And then I don't think that either of us would claim to be social Darwinists oh. of the cruder variety. Oh. Mm. Uh, well, how can this be organised? Well, that is the fundamental principle of the social contract. In almost all political thought, from Machiavelli to Hobbes or even Marx, it's assumed that men are... It is at least implied that human beings are fundamentally greedy and egoistic. Ah, of course. The selfish gene. Indeed, yes. Um... And so it is necessary that we have laws to make sure that there is no excessive cruelty, abuse or exploitation. And here the government, democratically elected as we now understand it, must step in. Would you agree, Margaret? Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, good. But this stepping in of the state requires spending enormous sums of money. Indeed, and we must be very careful. Such an enormous edifice of, of, of government intervention must be tightly controlled or unscrupulous elements will take advantage. Our public servants may be just as untrustworthy as those nasty capitalists, if you know what I mean. <laughs> to say nothing of the doll scroungers. Yes, uh, and, and time and time again, as you say, we see people cheating the system. Mm. So, it is better to make public institutions work on the same principles as private institutions, as far as possible, so that natural competition can stabilise prices, check for dishonesty, and above all, weed out the wheat from the chaff. Mm. Well, yes, then assuming that inequality is somehow inevitable, need the differences be so extreme between, say, the CEO of a global company and your average social worker, mm -hmm. differences which are sometimes quite obscene, yachts in the Bahamas or wherever, second or third homes around the world, whereas the majority of workers struggle to find anywhere to live. Well, let me take this one, if you don't mind, Margaret. This is a structural question and, frankly, one of, of basic economics. The CEO will produce more wealth for society, whereas the um, social worker or, or car mechanic, let's say, merely fulfills a role in society, a cog in the machine, if you will. Naturally, the CEO, who uh, must bear massive responsibilities, will be highly educated, and he, or indeed, yes, occasionally she, must be of the highest caliber. Every company must attract the top talent. Yes, indeed. And even at a national level, each country will need to compete for the best. If a UK company doesn't offer high enough salaries, the really bright people will go elsewhere. To the US, for example. Oh, oh God forbid. <laughs> well, excuse me, but shouldn't this imbalance be modified by taxes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell that to the fairies. <laughs> First of all, there are an infinite number of ways to avoid taxation, to say nothing of the current leader of the free world. And second, statistically speaking, any political party that proposes raising taxes will lose elections. Socialism is a dead duck. Well, I can't help agreeing with that. <laughs> I would even go further and state categorically that any country that tries to increase the power of the state in order to redistribute wealth is bound to fail. I mean, uh, look at Soviet Russia previously, or Venezuela today. Uh, well, if I may interrupt, 
There are certain countries which manage to find a better balance, with less inequality and less poverty than others. Some Nordic countries, for example. Or even, well, let's take Switzerland. Well, <laughs> yes, I, I suppose so, but, but look at the people. Some of the most boring in the world. I mean, what was it that Graham Greene said about the Swiss? The cuckoo clocks and all that. Oh, come on. That's old hat and not even true. <laughs> they were invented in southern Germany. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but seriously, the reason these countries can find a better way is because they are relatively wealthy and have small, easily manageable populations. I mean, you can't do that in complex, highly developed economies like the France or the US or, or the UK even. Uh, I mean, see what happens in Italy or, or Greece even. Oh, and then what about the developing countries? Or look what's happening in China. Oh, well, there's your answer to equality. Complete authoritarian control. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Everybody's the same over there, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't tell the difference between any of them. Oh, no. <laughs> draw things to a close now as we've run out of time. Allow me to thank you most sincerely on behalf of Badger News for this perceptive and erudite discussion and this stimulating insight into the state of the modern world. No, it's been an enormous pleasure. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <sighs> Professor, congratulations. You have done it. You have proved in front of a live audience that it is possible to create smart, and fully human, and without a doubt, far-sighted intellectuals. Yes, I think we can safely say that we have now reached a point at which we can honestly claim that we have managed to manufacture fully autonomous, politically aware, and most of all, emotionally sensitive human automata. This, in every sense of the words, is artificial intelligence. <laughs>